I will describe how an alien scout craft functions. I've been told its basic design. These are the words of my contact, who is not from this planet or any other. The person is a being of light, one who has gone through all the life experiences that we will. The craft is basically frisbee shaped and spins like one. The advantages of a rotating hemisphere are many. Not least is the increase in stability. For a simple test, try throwing an aircraft shaped projectile with as much accuracy as a frisbee. In its simplest form, this part of the hull is composed of a thick lead antimony alloy moulding, deployed to protect the occupants from any excess exterior radiation. Viewed from below, three chambers fixed at 120 degrees apart with their supply pipes are revealed. The chambers are an important piece of the propulsion gear, but they also provide a solid foundation when landing. These are also spinning. At the centre of the base is a selenium-based crystal resting on a solenoid electromagnet. An electrode is positioned at the top of the dome around which are nine beam portholes. At the base of the dome is a toroidal magnet. The importance of electromagnetism is fundamental to the operation of the craft. Two types of electromagnets are deployed, the toroidal magnet and the solenoid magnet. Together they create a magnetic signature that contours the craft. This is the containment field for an antimatter formation. The solenoid is made of 12 identical pieces, each sequentially switched at high speed to create a magnetic vortex. This energy distorts the gravitational flux adhering the craft to the ground, resulting in a substantial weight loss. The power chamber is the heart of the craft and contains two identical pieces of uranium, situated at the centre of the solenoid's hollowed core. Above and below are situated two filters and the solenoid is protected by a gallidium lining. The chamber is sealed and the air removed to create a vacuum. The uranium is used to provide positrons and electrons at regular intervals in a controlled thermonuclear reaction. Usually when particles are emitted from radioactive material they escape at great speed. However, due to the nature of the magnetic suppression, the emission speed of the charged particles is greatly reduced by a factor of five, making them more manageable. The process is initiated by firing two power beams at the uranium ends to close them tightly together. The power guns emit a coherent quark-based energy that repels matter. A device that propels protons is fired at the closed pieces. This manifests the release of more protons from the uranium atoms. A cascading effect takes place as protons are dislodged from neighbouring atoms and the production of displaced protons multiplies. When sufficient release time has elapsed, the pressure from the two guns is reduced. Internal pressures within the uranium, caused by nuclear force, motions the two halves apart. The exposed surface allows the generated particles to escape and the amplification ceases. Being at the centre of the solenoid's intense magnetic field, the charged particles are subjected to pressures which separate them at source. The positrons are forced towards the solenoid's south pole and enter and pass through a filter. The larger protons are reduced to their constituent parts, forming more positrons which also pass through. At the reactor's base is a six-sided crystal. When the positrons enter the crystal base, they try to follow the curve of the magnetic pathway, but are influenced by the crystal's symmetry. The positively charged nuclei of its structure repel the much smaller positively charged positrons and force them to adopt a lateral trajectory along its channeled matrix. The six positron groups enter an evacuated tube which guides them to a chamber. The positrons enter the fast-spinning, crystal-structured walls of the chambers and gather lateral momentum. The accelerated positrons are ejected into the atmosphere over 360 degrees. Simultaneously, the positron guns are fired and the released positrons follow the toroid's magnetic pathway, both downwards and also towards the electrode. Those positrons travelling away from the centre are given sufficient lateral momentum to take them clear of the craft's hull before being swept up by the solenoid's magnetic field. Those travelling inwards are quickly projected downwards and then upwards. Released electrons from the uranium are magnetically pressured towards the solenoid's north pole. They pass through a filter and are influenced by the negatively charged walls of the tube, which guides them towards the electrode, which adopts their electrically negative charge and is used to react with any unspent positrons. Positrons annihilate the atmosphere, rendering it unstable. When this occurs, several things happen. The positrons convert to photons upon collision with atmospheric electrons. The photons incur damage to surrounding atoms, producing atomic fragmentation and a yield of more positrons, which adds to the turmoil, creating additional photons and atomic fragmentation. This amplification consumes the atmosphere, creating a void into which the craft is pushed by surrounding matter trying to neutralise the area. 
To create momentum and imbalance of antimatter must be created. Placed around the base of the reactor is a group of electromagnets. The circular shaped array is composed of three main groups, which are also subdivided. When a deflector section is energized, its south pole is innermost. This field opposes the solenoid's own magnetic south pole field, deflecting the positrons down a new pathway. This means that they enter the crystal surface in a predefined area and exit only four of the crystal sides. They then travel down four supply pipes into two chambers. The resulting antimatter formation covers about half of the craft. These changes are effected almost instantaneously. The formation of antimatter over one half of its surface produces pressures on the craft's hull from ordinary matter trying to neutralize it. This propels the craft forwards. When the positrons are spent, there is a moment when the atmosphere is depleted, which forms a partial vacuum, which aids travel. It is this simple process that propels the craft to very fast speeds. This is very effective in outer space because space is full of transitional energy. The negatively charged hull reacts with any positrons within its vicinity. If the craft is completely stationary, the solenoid array is deployed to lessen the craft's mass attraction. This will be facilitated by rotation of the hull. The craft is energized to a high potential and the electrode will be the recipient. This creates an electrogravitic effect which levitates the craft. The three chambers engage and start to rotate. On this craft they are mechanically linked to the rotational hull. When sufficiently clear of the ground some of the positron guns are fired to tilt the craft so the power chamber can be initialized. This will send the antimatter clear of the ground and the craft is propelled forwards. This photo shows the profile of a similar craft. The antimatter outline is very close. In 1985, NASA took a video of the now famous tether incident. This is part of that sequence. I amplified the colors resident in the video using D-Stretch software, the same used by archaeologists to discover hidden cave paintings. This armada of UFOs all appear to use this system of propulsion. It displays the pulses of antimatter and the resulting in large frontal area in the direction of travel. The number of pulses dictates the speed. This craft in Earth's atmosphere is limited to about 40,000 kilometers an hour, which can be achieved in four seconds from stop. But in outer space, the speed is close to that of light. However, in these small craft, there are severe limitations when approaching the speed of light that involve the physiology of the person inside. It is detrimental to one's health to exceed the limit. That is why they choose to distort space-time. It is much faster and less harmful to enter another realm, one where space is not a reality. This video attributed to Bob Lazar shows a Batman insignia of the approaching craft. This photo shows the area of least density between the two chamber releases. This would not be noticeable in complete darkness. In daylight, the antimatter area may not be noticeable at all except for some visual distortion. There is always some inefficiency causing photon release in the visible spectrum. This can be controlled to produce a range of colors used to stimulate those on the host planet. Different portions of the deflector magnets can be energized to create an imbalance in the two drive chambers. This implements horizontal steering. If the positron guns and the drive chambers are imbalanced, it will affect vertical trajectory. The mothership is a craft used to transport people over vast distances. Its size is dependent upon the alien race that constructs it. The larger craft are in excess of 16 kilometers in length and can carry as many as 2 million people. Inside, they resemble an organized city on several levels. Their food is often little more than a specially formulated tablet that contains all the essential nutriments. Some luxury food is grown on board, and they often spend time to harvest a planet's surplus food resources, although they are non-essential. When several years are spent traveling, this diversion is rewarding. In normal space, the mothership is powered by a plasma engine. The craft is steered by a network of energy beam units mounted at the opposite end of the craft. A neutron mass is at the center of a cylindrical magnet. It is fired upon by an argon laser emitted from a board hole situated at the center of the drive solenoid. This action heats the mass to 4 million degrees Kelvin. The intensity of the cylinder magnet's magnetic field is increased to produce a reaction within the superconducting metal band. It procreates a release of high energy antineutrons which speed towards the center of the chamber, driven by the magnetic pressures. The intensity of the laser is increased to superheat the neutron mass to 25 million degrees Kelvin. When the antineutrons bombard the neutron mass, there is a massive inversion of energy 
and the formation of high energy plasma. The drive solenoid's power is increased to enforce the discharging energy through an aperture into space. This energy, consisting of 98% gamma radiation and 2% cosmic radiation, is powerful enough to convert all of the ordinary matter in its path into antimatter. Energy distribution in the larger ships can exceed 3.5 kilometers. The pressure of neutralizing matter on the craft's hull potentially forces the craft to speeds many times that of light. Electrons are released and are captured for life support. It will be discovered that certain superconductors, when in the presence of an intense magnetic field, will release antimatter of various forms, depending on the superconductor's molecular components. In the mothership, a superconductor is chosen that will release antineutrons. Your scientists will also discover that space is full of energy of relative uniformity. There are no areas of vacant space. As the craft approaches that of light, two things would happen. Its molecular structure would disintegrate and its occupants would perish. For those reasons, its speed is limited to about three quarters that of light. Similar to the smaller scout craft, it must enter space-time to travel great distances. This is simply a manipulation of space itself that adheres to the laws of physics. This craft is more powerful and can be raised to a much higher level, one that humans are incapable of conforming to. It is for this reason when you are taken for a long journey you have to adopt what you call the astral state. You are an immature being of light, and this is your subdued natural form, freed from the constraints of the physical body. Question. You mentioned that the drive solenoid exerts pressure on the gamma radiation. How is this possible? You are aware that it is photonic radiation and therefore not ionized. There are problems when I disclose information, for I do not want to hinder the progress of your scientists. However, I will say that a solenoid of sufficient magnitude can alter the pathway of several otherwise uncontrollable particles. Question. When traveling at light speeds, how are obstacles avoided? As you have just deduced yourself, at speeds above that of light, there are no obstacles, for matter in the true sense of the word does not exist. However, at sublight speeds, there is a problem. The output from the plasma engine will annihilate nearly everything that comes into its pathway. It is for this reason that we cannot use this engine when close to a planet's atmosphere. The only substance that is unaffected is one that you have little knowledge. The sides and stern of the craft are protected by a slipstream of the antimatter as it moves along. The craft has been photographed in your atmosphere when it is using auxiliary engines, those not harmful to your environment. It is no accident that things seem to fall into place. By thought and perseverance, the secrets of this universe can be found.